Hello, dear friends. Welcome to this evening talk brought to you by the Spiritist Society of Bournemouth and Paul Christian Spiritualist Church. I am Fabrício Assunção from the Spiritist Society of Bournemouth. I'm currently on holiday tour of England and Wales, so tonight I'm speaking to you from Cambridge. At the Spiritist Society of Bournemouth, we broadcast many Spiritist studies online each week in English or Portuguese. If you'd like to take part of our events or tune in to any of our activities, please go to our Facebook page for further details. For our presentation tonight, we are honored to have our guest speaker, Silvia Dippens, who will be talking to us on the question, why fear life when we were born to be happy? Tonight's event is one of the series um, talks exploring the psychological series of books of the spirit Joanna de Angelis. psychographed by the famous spirit medium to God of Thumb. Our guest speaker, Sylvia, is a former secretary of the British Union of Spiritist Societies. She is a humanist counselor, a regression and past life therapist, an interpreter and a translator. A very warm welcome to you, Sylvia, and it's a great pleasure to have you leading our studios tonight. Before um, we start our study, let's go to our friend Lauren Seville at the Full Christian Spiritualist Church for our opening prayer. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Fabrizio, and a very good evening to everybody. And welcome to a, another of our joint Spiritist Spiritualist Collaboration Nights. So if we could just take this time now, please, just to separate ourselves from all that besets us to step aside from our physical life, our cares, our concerns, our worries, and just immerse ourselves in this evening, this education, these thoughts shared, teachings disseminated. And let us celebrate that knowledge and that truth that life is eternal. It is an unbroken thread of continuity <coughs> from one existence to another, and always acknowledging the presence of the divine within each and every one of us and everything that surrounds us. So as we enter into this energy this night, we ask to open up our hearts and our minds and to immerse ourselves in the teachings given, that they may stimulate new growth and progression for that which is intended for all of humanity. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lawrence. Now it's my great pleasure to hand it over to our guest speaker, Sylvia Giffins. Sylvia, over to you. Thank you. Hello. Good evening, everyone. It's an amazing pleasure to be here with you, sharing this few moments and um, sharing, you know, what we're going to, to, to talk about today. And so it's... Um, uh, you know, as I said, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you, sharing this moment and ask God's blessings to each and every one of us. So today, the theme I chose was um, why fear life if we are born to be happy? And um, this, I know sometimes it sounds quite a bit uh, it's strange because people say, well, you know, but I have a lot of unhappinesses. Why um, are we born to be happy? And we can recognize that some people have more problems than others. This is undeniable. And it's not denying anything. Uh, we respect that everyone has their experience. So the point we want to make is that in whatever situation, there is always something that we can get out of. So um, I looked actually in the dictionary to, for, um, you excuse me, I will read some of the things because I don't want to get lost. Um, I looked up in the dictionary uh, for the um, explanation for happiness. And the dictionary says that, um, Contented, pleased, fortunate, pleasing, uh, and expressions happy go lucky, and uh, for happiness. So it does 
have all that, but doesn't actually explain what happiness is. It's just this different states of being really that they, the dictionary gives to us. So that's already something to think about because it's not properly defined. So there's different ways of looking at what happiness is. So um, we have, we know that in the, in the world that we live, it's not, we cannot have a complete and total happiness because um, it's, it, we are in, in a world that um, there are many, many difficulties, there are many, many problems. And as spiritists, we know that we are in a world of trials and tribulations, passing on to a different world now, but we're still very much into that. Uh, so we ha we come to this world for a lot for lessons that we need to learn for our lives. So um, the way as well that we look sometimes of for happiness, um, it's more or less an illusion. We think of this happiness as being um, a state of completely all the time. It doesn't exist. It's an illusion happiness we have moments and because also we tend to look at happiness as wealth as uh, physical appearance that people are beautiful uh, we think also in intelligence someone is very smart or fame and all fortune and all this kind of things and we see that sometimes we, we tend to think, oh, those people are so happy. They have everything. They have money. They have fame. They have fortune. And we see that that's not quite true. And it's quite surprising sometimes to us when we see someone who seems to have everything and, you know, they take on to drugs, they go into drink, or even, you know, in many cases, unfortunately, even suicide. As we know, there are very famous people that have committed suicide at quite a young age. And it's very, very sad when we see that. And it's also quite a shock and surprising because one thinks that they had everything to be happy. Why are they not happy? And that, that's one of the, the things that we need to stop and think about. Um, when I was preparing, re doing the reading for this talk, I was reminded of a book by Charles Dickens called The Tale of Two Cities. And in the book, he says, um, he talk, of course, he's talking about the French Revolution and he said, it starts, the book starts, it was the worst of times, it was the best of times, it was a time of change. And although he was talking about the French Revolution, we can bring this, it's quite actual for the moment that we are living through in our planet at this moment, because it we are living in a world of extreme um in one side, technology has advanced to such a high extent that we can now put a spacecraft on top of an asteroid to study it, to learn from it. And this is traveling at thousands of miles an hour. We can send uh, crafts as well to the bottom of the ocean, to the abyss side of the ocean, to study, to learn things. We have now medicine uh, that can cure diseases that until not too long ago, meant certain death if you had that disease. And now most people survive because the treatments are, are becoming more and more advanced. So we have this part, <coughs> forgive me, that um, in one side, you know, we, we now can talk to the other side of the world in seconds, I mean, it's, it's like the person is here. Even what we are doing right now is such an advanced technology that if it may be a, two, three years ago was done, but not as much as now. It's, it's just become part of the normal for everyone's life now, what we're doing here using this technology. So in many ways, we, we are extremely advanced, but also with all this, we have never been so poor 
in relation to hope, to the sense of belonging, to meaning in our lives, or to, to have proximity, being close to people. We are very distant. And, and it's such a contradiction because life is, has become easier and on the other hand has become harder. And I think, you know, COVID has um, brought to us the sense of isolation in, in a quite, it was like quite a bomb exploding in front of our faces. Suddenly we couldn't be with anyone, we had to be totally isolated. But I, I was thinking that um, we hadn't realized that we already isolated um, you know, it's often, if you take a bus or the tube, um, you see people, I, it's often, I see this more, I have seen this more than once, that I have a couple and they are there, um, each one on their phone and they don't talk to each other. Everybody was on their phone and everyone is on the phone. So no one talks to anyone that's there. And it's quite often sometimes, you know, we go to, to meet a friend for a coffee or something. And the person says, you know, the phone rings and says, oh, I have to answer this. Sorry, I have to, to get this. And we are there, you know, with the person and uh, they're on the phone with somebody else. Who we, who God knows where they are. Um, and we and we do the same it's not saying you know the others do it and we don't we do the same sometimes we don't even realize but if we are the one listening we see that the person actually the conversation could really have waited that 15 20 minutes that we are together having a cup of coffee was not that important they didn't really need to answer that call and it reminded me because uh, a colleague of mine said that um, she went to dinner with a friend of hers that she hadn't seen for a while because she had moved out of London and um, they were having dinner and the phone of her friend kept going and she answered the phone. So by the time she had, after the third call, that was really important that she would take the call. Um, as soon as she put the phone down, um, this colleague of mine got her phone and called her. And she said, why are you calling me if we are sitting together? And she said, yes, but you see, I really, really want to talk to you. And so far, you've been talking to three different people and I'm not talking to me. So I thought maybe if I use the phone, we'll be able to talk together. Um, she was a bit taken aback, but she, you know, switched off the phone and from the rest of the evening, they actually could have a nice meal and I had a nice chat. But and it seems so funny and quite crazy, but it actually happened because the person is so busy with somebody else. So now with the COVID, we forced us to be on our own. We all complaining that oh, we don't have, we miss the hug, we miss this, we miss that. But in a way, we're already quite isolated from everybody else. And I think that's one something that you know, once God willing, all this will go. We'll be able to take stock and think and value the people to, you know, that are close to us, our friends uh, or relatives, whoever it is, our family, and value them more and really, really uh, value their presence with us, talking to, to us. Um, so this is one of um, the things that really brought to mind that we are not happy. And I, I've, was thinking, um, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, how many times have we actually stopped for five minutes in our lives and asked ourselves, what makes me happy? What shall I do to make my life a little better? What is it that I don't I want to do that will make my life happy? And honestly, I haven't done this many times, and I don't think many people do. We are completely so aware. We are so busy. We have to be there, do something. And, and, and you know, like we were talking before we started the meeting today, how 
is going quickly. You know, we almost, I think, Laurie said that in about six or seven Fridays will be Christmas. And it's quite frightening that we're already seeing the beginning, the end of this year and the beginning of the new one. And this year was very difficult as well, very hard, but although things are getting better now. So I think one of the things we need to really stop and ask ourselves, you know, about our friends, uh, what makes us happy? Is it our family? Is it our friends? Is it our job? Is it the way we look? Is it because I can do something important? What is it that really, really um, makes us happy? makes us maybe not so much happy, but contented. And I think this is something we really, each and every one of us have to stop and ask ourselves and then change what we don't like and make it better. Um, so I think this as well, you know, because we imagine happiness being something and they have this expression, which I think comes from the Declaration of Independence in, in America, the pursuit of happiness. Our pursuit of happiness is, is the thing that we need. To, and, and it was meant that we would be free to look for some a better life for ourselves. But now it has become quite... Um, um, a, a way of, you know, a pursuit of happiness is, is this aim that we want, and it's it's completely um, outside of ourselves. It's not in something um, we we look for happiness in in things that are intrinsically they have no value to make us happy, because we look for happiness in in material things, in wealth, in the way we look, because we're young. Or, um, and people, you know, sometimes once they're getting a bit older, they go to extremes. Uh, recently, I saw um, a photograph of a, a very well-known uh, American actress. And if I had not read her name, I would have not recognized her. She has changed so much. Her whole face, even plastic surgeries, they have completely changed. Because that's the pursuit of happiness. That's the, um, you know, because I have to look young. And they, they lose themselves. Their own character has gone from their face. And... In many ways, we do as well this thing because we're looking for happiness outside of ourselves and we shouldn't. And um, because we also know that life as, as it is, is challenging. There are a lot of things. There are many moments in our lives that are sad, a difficulty. We have to face uh, illnesses, breaking up of relationships, loss of loved ones. And those things challenge us. And we suffer in those times. But I think in everything, there is that, what can I learn from that? We cannot get desperate. There is always a lesson to learn. And it's through this, through this changing, to, to facing some difficulties that we actually learn and we become better people. Because if we go through a certain situation of suffering or pain, if we lose someone we love, when we hear that someone lost someone they love, we can empathize with them. You know exactly what they're going through. You know the pain that they're going through. So this is, is not a, a wasted or sometimes people go and then they blame God because God is at fault. You know, he, look what he's done to me. I have this illness or a family member has this illness and we tend to, to blame God and some people even live and they don't want to believe in God anymore because God was terrible to do that to them. And we lose the lesson that we have to learn. Because in a way, um, we are here on this earth for learning, to get knowledge, and also to redo some of the mistakes we made in our past. 
That's the purpose of it. And when we have to redo, readdress wrongs, sometimes it's a battle. We have to be very conscious of it, we have to be aware of what we want to do. And we have to change who we are in many ways to make ourselves a, a lot better. So um, th that's one thing that, you know, we, is something we have to talk about and think about. Uh, I remember once I read, uh, Carl Jung wrote a book, an introduction to a book um, of one of his friends. He wrote, uh, Jung's friend wrote a book called The Holy Man of India. And in the introduction to this, it was in the 40s, Jung wrote an incredible uh, introduction to this book. <laughs> I remember the introduction, I can't remember the book very well, I'm afraid. But Jung makes a, a, um, a comparison between the people in the East and the people in the West. And he said, in the West, we are forever looking for happiness, for um, fulfillment outside of ourselves, in goods, in what we have, a better car, a better bag, a new shoes, uh, a better house. Whereas in the East, people are more spiritual. They look for something that was more fulfilling spiritually to them. And... This was back in the 40s, it was quite prophetic and was a completely right analysis. But now we see that with globalization that we have now, I think this division is very quickly disappearing. That pursuit for spirituality is being quite quickly lost in, in the East as well, unfortunately. But maybe as well is, is the point in which that we all come together and we all going to be uh, learn in the, in the same way. So I think that um, uh, is something important because I think in looking for something outside of ourselves, we lose ourselves, we lose meaning, we lose a sense of belonging, we lose a sense of self, um, that of self-importance somehow, because we have no purpose. And this is very painful. And I think that's what creates what well, all we see um, about, you know, existential problems, the way depression has increased so much, um, where, you know, a, a lot of mental problems, suicide, all of those have gone, and especially in young people, because I think we tend to give to, to give to young people, oh, you know, the best phone, you know, you see children, five, six, seven years old, with the latest Apple phone, because, you know, their friends have the best sneakers and this and that, we, and we don't teach them that those things are only for show among the friends, but that they intrinsically, they do not fulfill them. So, you know, when they come to the age of 15, 16, 17, uh, if they don't have those things, they'll feel very depressed. They feel that they not can, they cannot be part of the group. And I think sometimes you see quite a lot of movies, you know, especially uh, talking about young people who feel uh, let out because they don't have the last shoe or they cannot afford to dress the same way as somebody else dressed. As in my time, everybody had uniforms, so we, we, everybody was dressed the same. But we have this. So young people feel very um, left out of what it is because, of course, everything is to do with their appearance, rather the sense of who they are. And we also lose our meaning. And I think when we lose a meaning and purpose in life is that when we become afraid, we become afraid of life. And we, and because we are afraid of life, we become afraid of death. So we live in constant anxiety, uh, afraid to live and afraid to die. And, and I remember this song, I think it was a group, it was a band called The Tremulous a long, long time ago. Maybe you, Laurie, know, remember them. Um, but they had this song and said, this world is a bad place. Is a very bad place. Um, he says, um, I have is a bad place, is a terrible place to be, but I don't want to die. Um, and it's a beautiful song, but 
and and we leave this we think the world is terrible everything is horrible that's going on but we don't want to die because we're afraid of death because death because we're living in this fear of life we're afraid of living because we don't look the way we should look or our appearance is different or we don't have as much money as somebody else they have a better car and we, there is this constant envy jealousy bitterness um because somebody else has something better than we have but also when we are the ones who have things we feel superior to other people because we have a best mobile phone or we have the best the, the latest ipod or we have this beautiful car or our house is nicer than somebody else's and we somehow you know we feel superior to other people and when the other people have we feel a bit inferior to them which is completely um unacceptable but that's somehow seems to be the world we, in which we, we are living now. But there is a, a thing, Joanna G. Angelis, um, in her book, uh, Be Happy Now, Seja Feliz Agora, Hoje, um, she says that when, uh, I, I will read this, I think it's better to quote directly from Joanna. Um, she says, when difficult and painful situations occur in our lives, that we must not complain or curse and let ourselves see what we can learn from the difficult situation that we are going through. Um, and she said that because existence, she says that existence needs transcendental stimulus so we can reach the aim that awaits us so in a way she was saying you know that our life is like a rocket you know it's full of fire it's full of all that and then he send it out into space and then the fire goes and it's peaceful and sometimes we need to have those kind of things to move us away from a comfort zone because sometimes we can rot in our comfort zone, afraid of getting a new, new start, afraid of doing something else. So sometimes when life difficulties happen, it's an opportunity for us to see what we made of, because we only know what we can do once we try. And it's so easy for us to stay uh, in that job, even though we don't really feel that we're realizing our potential, uh, but we get enough money to live quite well, or we are in a relationship that doesn't quite please us, but oh, at least you have someone with you. And we always settle for what is easy. And sometimes something happens at the breakage or you get fired or made redundant or something it's that push that sometimes we need to you know it's like someone comes and kicks us out and then suddenly you're having to face a lot of difficulties and you have but on the other hand is that what gets us it strengthens us to to do our best to and to see how strong we are and many times in life once we go through a situation and at the time we feel completely overwhelmed, we don't think we can do it, but time passes, everything goes, everything, everything passes. Um, then we look back and say, oh, I can't believe I was able to do that. I can't believe I overcame that problem. My God, I felt so annoyed. How can I, how? did I do that? And you feel so happy because you feel strong. And, you know, I think Nietzsche in his book at Omo, he said, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. And I think that's quite true. But we don't know until, um, you know, we, we, until we go through certain things and we put ourselves out there fighting with the fire. A friend of mine used to say, oh, sometimes you have to jump in the arena and fight the bull. <laughs> he had some funny things like that. Uh, but, you know, now I understand. Sometimes you just have to face the problem face to face and see, you know, how much you can. Even 
and we sometimes we think that if if we fail that's going to be bad and it's not because even failures it's a lesson teaches us something new uh, we know how strong we are or how weak we are we are not the person we thought we were uh, but mostly i think Personally, I, I feel this, that most those situations that happen, once you can face them and go through them and do what you need to do with them, it's always a positive step. It's always a life affirming. It's always giving you meaning and um, a purpose in life. And that's what we need. We need to feel that we are useful, that our life has in some way um, we are fulfilling what we need to do. I think as, as human beings, as uh, we need to feel that we are useful. That's why um, uh, when someone loses their job, sometimes they feel a bit down and because they, you know, not that thing of preparing yourself, going to work, facing a day, facing situation, facing problems, make you feel as if you are doing something in the world, not doing anything. It's the most depressing and unfulfilling thing that we can do. So we always need to, to feel that we are doing something and to you know, be it by writing a book, raising a child, creating a new project. It doesn't need to be something very enormous. Maybe just a plot of land, you know, a plot of land that you go and you plant some flowers or plant some vegetables, the working on the land and feeling it and seeing things grow. And, you know, like if you plant a lot of vegetables, I think you can have this beautiful salad. And it's so fulfilling because you are the one who planted it, you watered it, you took care of it, and now you're enjoying it. And, and I think happiness is this is being contented with little things, it's being content with what we have. And I think many times we tend to look always towards someone who's up there and we forget to look back. I remember once talking to the spiritual benefactor and he said to me, sometimes you need to stop and look back at, at your shoulder, what's coming behind you. And sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to look behind us because there is always someone in an worse condition. There is always someone who doesn't have anyone to talk to. Um, and, and this is, you know, there is a lot of poverty in the world. There is a lot of uh, suffering. We know that we don't need to have anybody uh, going through poverty and starvation in this world that we have now but unfortunately that's still this but also people who have lots of money sometimes i i i have experience of this i worked for a time in a shop i would sell papers newspapers magazines and that kind of thing um and in a very expensive area of london very rich area of london um, so some of the people there, they, they were not what you could call poor. And sometimes I think they were quite rich by the jewelry or the way they had. But there was so much loneliness. There was so much pain, you know, and they, they looked so miserable. And, and I remember that I used to say, good morning, how are you? It's nice today. Or it's cold today. And there were people who could, I, I remember that there, you know, more than once this happened, as sad as it is, they would actually let people go in front of them so they could come to my counter to the till where I was working because they knew I would talk to them. <laughs> it's completely crazy. And, you know, just saying hello, goodbye, and how are you today? Oh, nice to see you again. And it's nothing, it's absolutely nothing. But somebody said to me once, you talk to me more than my daughter does. And I'm a total stranger working in a shop. And then you see that 
in, you know, not only having money doesn't make you be fulfilled or happy. And because there are so many people completely feeling isolated with no human contact at all. And I think that's something uh, we need to, to think about because sometimes just smiling at a person in the street, you're changing their day. Or, or we ourselves, I mean, we ourselves sometimes when we are unhappy, we go in the street and someone looks at us, you know, take a second look and maybe smile and you feel, oh, you feel acknowledged. And I think in, in the world that we are living, that's so busy, most people are on their phones nowadays, very few people actually can see you. And you wanted to be seen, you wanted to be recognized that you exist. And um, we want to, to give other people as well the same that we, we wanted for ourselves. And this, I, I find that this is, is very um, important. Uh, the Spirit Emmanuel that you write with Chico Xavier, he says, is the well-being of others. We are happy when we make other people happy. Our happiness will bring joy to people. And sometimes we're not very happy, but we make other people happy. And the, what comes back makes us really cheerful. You know, you sense that you helped someone. And I think it is the well-being of others is something that's precious because it means that we are affecting in a very subtle, in a very small way, somebody else's life. Because an action that can be quite small for us can be quite big for the person who's going through a moment of difficulties. You know, sending a prayer to them. You know, some people don't accept prayers and things, but you can pray to them anyway. You send them good vibrations, you send them. And they say, oh, I was thinking about you the other day and I remember something so funny. And I think, oh, yes, that day I was praying for this person and uh, they received it. <laughs> it's really interesting that because it comes to you like this, you know, someone saying, oh, I thought of you. You remember when you used to do this and we used to laugh and that made me laugh. And, and I have had occasions in what, that I was feeling very low for some reason. And somebody called me and said, oh, you know, I was thinking about you and, you know, I haven't seen you for a long time. And it changed completely your day. So I think we need to be aware of it, to be there for people in, in many ways, with our prayers, with our thoughts, with our, um, with our ears to listen to them, give them the opportunity to tell us. Because I think sometimes, and I, and I really fail as well, many times I do, um, I don't always give the time to listen to someone. And they may be needing to talk they may be needing to tell them. And it can be quite something in your eyes, quite simple. But for that person who's telling you that their story or whatever is happening to them, it's very important to have someone to listen to them. And I think uh, as friends, sometimes we are so busy with ourselves or our worries about this, that and the other, what's happening, what's my phone, who's calling me now and what do I have to do after I leave here, that we don't give the due time to listen to, to the friends or, or to whoever wants to talk to us. And sometimes can be a strange person that you meet in a cafe, who's sitting there with your paper, with your book, and then they sit there by themselves and you smile at them and suddenly they start talking and they want to tell you things. Um, and I, I find that this is important for us to stop and to give some, that moment for someone else to to be able to talk to to you and tell about them and they will feel that they are being recognized they're being accepted um so uh also i mean this um one of the things as well that we have is um the idea to have the spirituality, to have the acceptance that this life 
no matter how difficult it is or how easy it is, some, for some people are harder than others. We cannot deny that their challenges are bigger. But we also know that God does not give um, a cross heavier than anyone can bear. So if we have a heavy cross, it's because we are strong enough to, to hold it. And sometimes it's good to know how hard it is because you can ask somebody to come and help. Um, and it, it does, you know, people will come towards you to give you a hand. But also I, I, I find that the knowledge that we have, that this life is only, you know, this is a sojourn we're going through on this earth. That life doesn't stop once the machine that holds a, a spirit it stops. That the life will go on, no matter the sacrifices we're making or, or you know, to study. Sometimes we work, but we want to have to change our careers, or you want to do something else, or something that pleases us, it's about art, it's about music, and we make that little sacrifice. And whatever we're doing is going to be good. First of all, it helps us. It helps our brain and neurons and makes our brain work and keeps us healthier longer. But also everything that we make an effort to learn now is going to be good for us because we will, in our new life, we already have that knowledge. So it's always good to invest in a, in a self-enlightenment and learning and getting knowledge. Uh, this is always very, very important because um, that in doing that, not only we, we are enriching our own spirit, but also we're giving our life meaning. And this is very, very important for us to feel that we are doing something. We are doing, because whatever people do for us, it doesn't do it. You know, we feel grateful, we feel it's wonderful, but it's what we do, is when we put our hands to the plow and work the, the earth, work the soil, that's how, when we feel that we are fulfilled. Things that are showered on us, we don't really value. I mean, you see this in, in, in children, you know, when we are young, when we are babies, they are so wise. And then afterwards, for some reason, I don't know, education, whatever, we, we begin to lose it. But you have a child, they have all these expensive toys, they, they even did a study on this, actually. I remember years ago, I, I saw this study. They, they gave these children, toddlers, all these incredible toys. And um, they put little bits and pieces of paper, little tubes, um, you know, things like that. And the children, without exception, they would go to the toys that were shining and things, but they would always go to the to the little bits and pieces to put start putting things together. And that's what <laughs> creates, you know, the creativity. That person may be, be an engineer because he, he was learning things. And I think children, that parents or, you know, an adult will take time to show them how to do things. They are the ones who are going to progress and be very creative and will achieve maybe much more than someone who be on their mobile phones all the time, you know, talking in social media and everything. Because that that's one of the things as well that we have social media. I mean, when I was young, we didn't have social media, we had friends that we met and talked to. And we all shared, we went out together. So all photographs were us together. Nowadays, you have, you know, a lot of Facebook and people going on expensive holidays or they're going to parties or they go. And if you can't do it, if you so let them, oh, my God, you see, they are so much happier than I am. And we don't know the sacrifice sometimes they are making to go. And sometimes this part is not as nice as we think it is. But we somehow we began to, to lose the, the ourselves to to live other people's lives. Um, and also, you know, one thing that I, I personally find quite hard to swallow is this expression that we seem to hear all the time, my truth. 
And I think, what does it mean, my truth? And whatever truth they have excludes everybody else. You are not allowed to have your own opinion, your own feelings about something, because that's my truth and everybody has to accept it. So excluding everybody else and in person i don't think there is such a thing as my truth what is truth is true for everyone and if it isn't because it's not a real truth and we need to be more inclusive accept that you think different from the way i think and i think different from you i think but you have something that you can teach me i have something that i can teach him and that's how we grow you know, we seem to be losing uh, because I, we are so filled with my own truth and, oh, my God, you know, I can't. And, of course, once we are in this frame of mind, we begin to think how other people should live, how other people should live their lives, what they should do with their lives. So we become extremely judgmental. We condemn people that we don't even know because they behave in that way. Look at that. Uh, because we are within our truth and our truth doesn't accept that, which is completely useless. And in the end, only isolated us from the people who maybe could be our friends or could be someone that would help us. We need to be really more accepting, more um, getting to us um, something that once we give out, we take in as well. And we, we need to learn as well how, how to give, you know, because if we live in darkness, we cannot give light. We don't know any light. So how can we give it? And I think one thing that, that Joanna says, um, I mean, towards this, um, Joanna says that the key, uh, I, I will read it if I may, see, excuse me, please. Um, Joanna Giangeli says, the key to happiness on earth was given by Jesus 2000 years ago and is resumed in this. Love your neighbors, you love yourself, and do wish and do not wish for others what you do not want for yourself. So even now, you know, we are quite forgetful, forgetful what Jesus taught us. But I think what he says is for us to be good to ourselves, to be loving, to be caring to ourselves, to forgive ourselves. So we can love others, we can give them the, the time that they need, because we know how we are respected. We need to give forgiveness and love because we need that. So the only thing, and Joanna says also that the only things that last forever is love, because it origins, it it's comes from the creator and all the work of the universe is the manifestation of the creator's love for us and to ourselves. So um, if we go, the aim for us to fulfill a life is to give, to love, to forgive, to have understanding, to be able to see the other person with all their faults and potential and like them, because we that's how we like to be liked and loved and respected for what we are. So going back to the beginning for the expression of happiness, I think it's, happiness is a pleasure of work, is being content with what we have and feel fortunate that we are able to achieve more, is to be grateful to be able to serve and to take a go lucky attitude when things are not so going so well for us. If we take an attitude of light and, and let's see how I can do with this, and we will feel a lot better. And um, so, you know, we were born to be happy, to make our lives and the lives of others happy. That's the gift that God gave us, to be happy because as his children, we are the inheritors of the universe. So I come 
to a close here. I think there is questions, isn't there? If there are any. Thank there you. There are indeed. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> That was lovely, Silva. Thank you very much. Great reflections there. A lot of things for us to reflect. Loads of insights there for us to take away. Um, there are a few questions popping up here on Facebook. Uh, and also a few comments. I'm just going to yeah. read it out. Um, we have a comment from Elsa. Uh, she said, we only feel happiness when we have compassion, charity help with love and we announced to so many things in order to serve on behalf of higher spirit mm -hmm. and next one is a question from our friend sue she says um Sylvia, do you feel we have been conditioned to be busy doing quotation mark having adopted the roles we have been allocated from birth chasing the missing something, seeking extremely externally for answers, also externally striving for external validation, which has led to disconnection from life around us. Yes, I, I think in, in some ways we, we we have been conditioned to to work and to achieve. I think the, the whole thing about uh, life, uh, uh, schools and everything, you have to achieve, you have to have the best marks because you have to go to do this. But I think we can break the circle once we become aware that we are busy because, you know, sometimes we are busy doing nothing. Um, <laughs> Okay, expect you know you're doing three things at the same time. So you're here in your computer doing something, but then you remember you have something else to do, and then somebody calls and they ask something, and then you're going to do something, and you are doing three, four, five things at the same time, ending up doing nothing, feeling extremely frustrated. So once we come to a certain level of awareness that we are doing this, we are being busy, working these hours and extra hours and and sometimes even the workplaces, you know, they demand that you're there showing up. Um, we can break that. We can say, yes, I'm going to take time to do this. This needs to um, needs to be done first and this needs to be done second. And this can be left for tomorrow. I think this is, is very, very important to think that. So we can break this, this condition that this condition that is being put upon us or imposed upon us or because the things we learn, we, we follow this. If we become aware of it, we can cut from that, we can disconnect and then we can connect more to life. You know, sometimes maybe go for a cup of coffee with someone rather than calling them on the phone you know call them said can you meet do you have five minutes ten minutes and, and i think we can change this condition into um we we have been conditioned to many many things but i think we can uncondition ourselves once we become aware that we have become a busy bee doing you know, uh, mind you busy bees usually they are doing something and they work together um I think we can break this, this spell and uh, change and become busy when we need to be busy and take time for ourselves, for meditation, to take care of ourselves, to put some perfume on, to have our hair done, to, to read a book, to do something. We need that as part of our, to fulfill our existence as well. I don't know if I reply to you, to you but that's what I think we can break this condition to do being brought up through it. Thank you, Sylvia. So the next question is also from Sue. Um, how do you suggest people might be encouraged to go within and discover the divine treasure and connection and understand of who we truly are? Well, I think this will very much depend on the person. I think uh, what, you know, is best for them. I think um, maybe going for a walk, you know, taking half an hour of your day to go for a walk, look out to the sky, to, to the trees, to the people passing by. I think 
we we discover something you know when we go out and we see the sun or the rain and we think oh my god it's beautiful um sometimes like i look at my trees here outside of my garden and <laughs> yesterday was like it was raining because of the the it was like snowing the trees the leaves were coming out of the trees and today is completely different so we, it brings us to ourselves. It brings us something, gives us pleasure to see the sun or having a conversation or stopping and reading a book or maybe watching a, a movie that you like or even saw before, but that it touched your heart somehow. I think this is all part of, of this. And, you know, we can meditate, we can listen, we can stop to pray. Uh, there are so many <clears throat> different ways that we can go out of ourselves but I think maybe going out going for a walk or uh, sometimes a person may not be able to walk um, but you know just look at out of the window watch a film read a book um, phone someone to talk to and, and find as well things we like to do. Sometimes we like to do things with our hands. We like to paint, we like to draw, we like to write. You know, write a letter to yourself, uh, telling yourself everything that um, uh, you want to do, your plans, and then, you know, see the letter, maybe burn, send it out to the universe. If you cannot go out, you know, not everybody is able to, to move around so quick. But I think this, you know, like writing a letter to yourself, telling everything you like to do or, uh, is, is very good. And prayer, I always think that prayer is, and it's not that prayer that you keep repeating words, but, you know, sit down, just take two minutes with yourself and say, please, God, watch over me. I'm here. Please take my hand. You know, it's very healing. I, you know, there are many ways in the pen, but I think it is, is something that I try to do myself. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, the next question is coming up here as from our friend Bob. He says, happiness depends to or not continue with our resentments. So would you agree that we need to have a forgiving attitude as part of our generosity to others? Absolutely, absolutely, Bob, you are completely right. And I mean, that's exactly um, the point that, you know, uh, I read that thing from from uh, Joanna de Angelis that said, you know, when she talks about the teachings, the basic te teachings of Jesus is forgiveness and love. And we have to start forgiving ourselves as well, because that's it's very important, all the things that we don't like about ourselves. Um, let's forgive ourselves. We deserve as much forgiveness as everybody else. And once we are able to see our weak points and forgive that we are not perfect, but we are in process of becoming perfect, we are able to forgive others because what you said, that is absolutely true. We cannot flourish, we cannot grow if within our heart we have resentment and anger against others. If it's someone that you can actually talk to, talk to them, saying, you know, maybe this attitude, what you've done, I, I feel very uncomfortable about, about this. It might be someone that you don't have any more contact with you know write a letter you know like i said i think i'm a great believer in writing letters write a letter to that person in and tell them how you feel and then just burn them send them out to the universe get it out of yourself and see as well sometimes it's very easy because a person may have said something or done something which they didn't mean to hurt us and we took in a way that became hurtful to us so try to see the other person point of view as well. Maybe they didn't mean to and whatever, even if they did, let them go. Because honestly, resentment, anger, desire for vengeance, a weight that stones that we carry with us that we really don't need. 
put them down, you know, offer them to God. If you believe in God or if you believe in a deity or if you believe in the universe, just say, oh, you know, honestly, this is this resentment against this because this happened. I don't need it anymore. You can take it. Imagine that, you know, if you have a river nearby, imagine that you have this stone and you're taking it out of your back and throwing it. I, I'm a great believer of doing things, you know. I think sometimes just meditating, but doing things, you know. Go to a near river if you live near the sea. Now, this is my rock here. I don't need this. It's weighing on me. I don't need it. Take it. Send it to the water. Send it to the universe. And that's the way to, and things that we have against ourselves as well, because we are terrible critical, we are terrible judges of who we are and our failures. Let go of them. We don't need them. Because once you do that, take away resentment, comes forgiveness, you have a place for other things, forgiveness, acceptance, and friendship and love. And love is everything, everything. So you are right. Thank you. Okay. So it's coming up to our last comment um, of the night. It's a very interesting one from Sue. She says, own truth, I feel, is about a personal perception, a self-realization, a personal understanding, which might also change through our own soul growth. It's not a static energy. It's not about say, this is the way. Truth is unique to everyone, although there might be similarities with God. Yes, yes. I mean, the, the way you describe it is the way I understand it too. Uh, when I made the point is that sometimes we hear, especially in the press or something, that people go into their truth and everybody else is excluded. What you're saying here is, is uh, so growth, is, is someone that is aware. And we, we are aware. And, and when we come to the point, yes, it's a soul growth, it's static, it's moving accepts other people as well even if you don't agree with them i think i always remember um this quote from voltaire that he said i may not agree with you what you're saying but i will die for your right to say it and although what you're saying that's the way it should be it's not the way sometimes is represented uh, people can be quite strong that they have the truth they are holding it and everybody else is wrong and that is that's one of the the big problems that sometimes we have that's you know when i made the comment but the way you say it it's, it's a personal perception and a person and is your own personal perception it may not be good enough for me in my own perception also maybe not be good for somebody else so we, we share it and we grow together thank you um Elsalie says thanks to you in this talk you made my day so many reflections my dear thank you so i just um, would like to announce our next meeting so um our next meeting is on the 19th of uh, our next speaker is Evanice, and the topic that she's going to be discussing with us is hope therapy. Um, I hope to see you all there. Um, just before I hand it over to Lawrence for the closing prayer, is there any closing remark you'd like to make or yourself, Lawrence? Absolutely ah. enthralled. Absolutely wonderful talk. Thank you for sharing that. That was that really hit home on a lot of levels, and I know a lot of people share those sentiments as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Any closing remarks from you, Sylvia, before we go to the closing prayer? Well, I just, um, you know, this is more or less what, what I feel, what I try to do for myself when I'm becoming too intransigent or too judgmental. I try to say, stop it. You know, everyone is having their own difficulties. So respect them and try to help them if you can. And that's what I try to do. Um, you know, 
this is my experience and what I, I try. And with the knowledge of spiritism, uh, it makes me understand that I am a being among many beings and my future is light. I am a being of light, being now purified. It's like this huge diamond that we are and we are being polished. And one day we will reflect the life of God and because that's the life he gave us. So we are all fighting our own battles. And if we help each other, we will achieve the, what we want to achieve quicker. That's how I feel. Thank you very much. So Thank I would you. like to say. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me, first of all. <laughs> it's our pleasure to have you here with us. Um, okay. I'd like to say. Thank you to everyone who has been with us through Facebook and YouTube. And I would like to invite Lawrence for the closing prayer, please. Thank you, Fabricio. So once more, if we can draw into that silence, that peace, that place of the divine which resides within all things. We give thanks for sharing this evening, this small time, bringing with it a wealth and a compendium of thoughts to take away to reflect upon and practice in the coming days. We give thanks for this enlightenment that we receive through so many different avenues. At this time now, when we are not separated anymore by distance, but we are all reminded we all reside under the one sky, on the one planet, in the one heartbeat and moment, and we are all truly linked. We are all truly as one. No one is isolated, but we are all one on that path of progression. So as we leave this place, this virtual temple this night, take with us the love, the joy, and the sentiment from spirit that the progression that we go through is our ever continuing evolvement, spiritually, physically, and psychologically. And we thank you for this opportunity. Amen. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, everyone. And Thank I you hope to see much. you soon. Yes, and safe travels. You, you've been to beautiful places in England. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. God bless each and every one of us. Thank you. Good night. Um, good night. Good God night, bless. everybody. Bye.